and uh, we're in a new chapter, chapter 2. First Timothy chapter two. One of the things that's important to notice as well is, you know, you know these the chapters and the verses um, were the numbers were added in later. So originally when it was written, there isn't that demarcation, and that's quite important sometimes I think because I don't know if you do this, but in my mind when it comes to the end of a chapter, it's sort of like okay, so that's that subject finished, new subject, and it's not necessarily the case. I you know so, so it's always good to just go back. And read the last few verses before if you're starting a new chapter uh, and it's it can you know it can sometimes be quite illuminating um, as as we go through uh, tonight um, this is the start of our missions month so I'm also in these Bible studies I'm going to be doing just a couple of asides uh, well only one tonight uh, but, but just looking at where, where it's applicable um, you know, at some of the mission, missionaries through the ages, and 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 wherever it links in really with the teaching. Uh, so we'll do that that tonight as well. Okay. So First um, Timothy chapter two, starting at verse one. And we're going to do verse from verse one through to and including verse seven. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercession intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our saviour who will have all men to be saved and come to unto the knowledge of the truth for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Uh, so quite a lot there, quite a lot in this, this, this section. Um, and I'll do my best to do justice to it. So, it starts with this exhortation uh, for for supplication uh, and various other types of prayer. Supplication would generally be um, uh, prayer prayer in, in times of need uh, and and prayer in general. Offering up, offering up our desires to God, which is of course what we do when we when we meet together. You know, on Wednesday, on Tuesday night. Sorry, quite often it's requests, isn't it? You know, pray for this person, pray for that person, or, or needs in the fellowship. Whereas on Friday night, it's more giving thanks to God and and just you know, worshiping God really in, in prayer. And I think it's important to kind of to recognise there are different types of prayer. Um, that it's not just, you know, kind of like God's answer phone, you know, where you say, right, oh, I need this, 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 and this, you know. And I think, I think when you mature as a Christian, you start to understand that, you know, prayer can be so much more than just giving a list of requests, mm -hmm. but it can actually be you listening as well to what God is saying to you, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I'd encourage you to, when you do spend time in prayer. Um, not just to bring requests, of course, we're told to ask, seek, and knock, uh, but to be to to use all different types of prayer. Thanksgiving is a great one to start the day with. Thank you, Lord, for this and this, and and it will will change your whole mindset at the start of the day. Just thanking God for what He's done, and your faith will start to rise. Um, listening to God is a really important discipline as well just just sitting there and listening quite often I find it helpful to have the word of God in front of me as well and then and then God might direct you to something you're reading or may speak to you through what what you're reading or just speak directly um, directly to your to your heart and of course uh, not just praying for yourself but praying for the people you know and and as we, we, we start on this missionary month 
praying for people outside of your church you know praying for what god is doing in other countries as well i mean you speak to any missionary they'll they'll say yeah great if you can support us financially but what we really want is your prayers mm. you know and i think that's that's what i want to emphasize this month as well is you know pray for these works that are going on in very difficult situations difficult countries uh, and now it says here specifically verse 2 that we should pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty and and it's if it didn't say that i don't know whether i would think of that you know i, know, I would think of that or i need to pray for the prime minister or i need to you know pray for the queen uh, but when you think about it yes it is important because in order for the gospel to be preached uh, we need to make sure that there are no laws saying you can't preach the gospel or uh, in order to for us to have this bible study you know we need to make sure that there's no law saying right you can't have the bible in english like there used to be you know in time of the reformation uh, so praying for our leaders and the laws that, that, that they give and other things like you know just things like intimidation uh, you know we want to make sure that uh, those in authority and by that not just leaders but the police force uh, the justice system aren't going to persecute us as Christians uh, and are going to defend us as well against those who might persecute us so so when you think about it actually just really practical things um, to pray about now God can even under a tyrannical corrupt system cause the gospel to flourish you know he can uh, because even at the time of the New Testament church you know uh, they were living in occupied territory I mean you know the Roman uh, the, the Imperial Roman army was was in charge of the country and yet the church was able to start and to grow and to flourish but what what is far better is if there is a restriction on you having a Bible or on you and I meeting together like if there's a law you can't meet together unless you're a member of an official state um, authorized church then this would have to be in secret you know um, so uh, yeah I, I, I having thought about that about you know countries where the Bible is forbidden and so on I want to just give a little aside now um, to uh, about the missionary called uh, Jermaine Thomas and um, he, he was around in the 1860s in Welsh, uh, a Welsh missionary and uh, he, he was a Welsh missionary who went to uh, Korea and what he did is he got, he got on board um, a merchant vessel or ship and they were sailing down the, the, the Taidong River in Korea and uh, he couldn't actually get to the shore, they wouldn't let them land and so he came with this idea of throwing gospel tracts onto the shore and they had some Bibles as well. I'm not sure if they were actually in Korean, they may have just been in Chinese, but he thought, well, I can reach the shore and there's people there. So he threw them into, uh, onto the shore. And um, they were, the Korean officials repeatedly ordered the, the boat to leave. They said, you know, get out of here, you've got to leave. And eventually the boat ran aground. And uh, as it ran aground, it was attacked by, by sort of angry civilians and among the crew I've got the statistics here amongst the crew 14 were shot and killed four were burnt to death and and two that had jumped ashore were beaten to death and one of those who was beaten to death was this missionary um Jermaine Thomas and 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 you might think oh well what I tried to do that's that's it then you know, it was all in vain. Him throwing Bibles onto the shore was just a futile act. And then he died. Well, what's the point of that? But it doesn't actually end there. There's a really interesting twist. That there was a government official named Pak Yong Sik who took home some of the Bibles that had been thrown on, onto the shore, uh, onto the riverbank. And he decided to use the paper to wallpaper the rooms in his house 
and uh, because he was an official, you know, lots of people used to come uh, to his house for official business. And of course, as they looked up and saw the paper, the, these pages of this Bible on the walls, they started to read them. And some people started getting saved through reading the scriptures that were on uh, that were on the walls. Now it only came to light after, you know, uh, quite a few years, quite a few years after. But apparently, people started to come from all over Korea to read these words of this strange book that was on the walls of his house. And eventually, a church was established in the area. Fifteen years later, this place, which was called Pyongyang, became a Christian centre with a hundred churches. Mm. So isn't that amazing? Just from one guy throwing tracts and Bibles onto the shore mm. and hoping that somehow it might do some good. So I was like really inspired with that story. I thought, wow, yeah, God just does just mm. it's the willingness, isn't it? And and the heart to do it. And he was willing to put his life in danger and of course he did. Mm. It died. But but the result of that is that the gospel came uh, to Korea. So, getting back to our, our uh, uh, passage here, it's difficult, you know, to live in peace if you, if you are constantly uh, in, in danger of arrest, isn't it? So we're to pray that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So on the one hand, we're praying that the, we'll be able to preach the gospel, we'll be able to hand out tracts. We're not going to be uh, troubled either by, by angry people or by, you know, that if, if we are assaulted or attacked or whatever, that the police will come and, 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 and will arrest them and, you know, move them on so we can carry on. Or uh, we're also praying that we can live lives in godliness so that, that we're not living in a society where there's you know, uh, 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 lots of temptations, you know, in some societies where, you know, crime is, is, is not being dealt with, where, you know, there are unclean images easily accessible. And so you want to pray against that kind of thing so that people aren't under temptation. Now, when you're tempted, God can strengthen you through that. You know, if you're surrounded by temptation, you can overcome that and then become strong. But like the Bible generally suggests that you flee temptation like it says flee uh, fornication and so on so the idea is that is that you know we don't want temptation to be everywhere you know for for christians so that again is something that we that we pray about um so as we come down uh the, the, there's a verse that is probably the controversial verse in this passage uh <coughs> some people anyway um and it says in verse four so this is talking about God, our Saviour, nothing, hopefully nothing controversial about that. God, our Saviour, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. And uh, various Christians have, have argued about what that verse uh, might mean. And there are three uh, suggestions or three interpretations of that verse that I'll give you to think about. So, one interpretation is that all men, which, you know, I think we understand it includes women as well, that all men means all men. You know, that that, uh, that, he, that God wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, the, another interpretation is that it means all, all leaders of men. God wants all the leaders of men, all the kings, all the people in authority to be saved because uh, some people say, well, that's the context, verse two, kings and all those that are in authority. Uh, so it's referring to that. Uh, and then, and then the, the third uh, interpretation of it is that uh, it means all kinds of men, that uh, God wants all kinds of men to be saved and come to uh, the knowledge of the truth. So again, you know, context is, is important, immediate context, preceding context, uh, what we call epistolic context, that's the context of, of the epistle, its style, uh, how, how it's written, how does the writer use phrases and words uh, testamental context so it's context in the new testament 
you know so what I usually say is look at the immediate context and then s start to widen your circle if you're still not sure widen it out widen it out widen it out you know so you would look then at everything else Paul wrote well you'd look at first of all everything in first Timothy everything in second Timothy you'd read it then in the context of what else did Paul write who's he talking to then in the what, what do the other writers say and so that is a way you can really if, you, if you've want to do that kind of study you can really you know study it into the ground really if you're not sure what um what it's saying um there is a principle used it's used in philosophy and it's used in theology and it's known as occam's razor you might have heard it or you might not have heard of it and the idea is that if you have competing hypotheses in other words there's, there's like we have here there's 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 various you know interpretations of it uh, that you go for the one that has the least assumptions behind it um, so you would go for the plain and simple meaning unless it's something strange or you know so like for example in Daniel where it talks about uh, you know I saw a goat uh, that, that was that was moving north south east and west and he kind of hovered it's probably not talking about a hovering goat you know because that would just be strange it would just be weird you know so so you you tend to go for the the, the, the way Occam's razor works is you go for the one that has the least assumptions behind it um, so, as we look down First Timothy here, um, he starts off, doesn't he, uh, in verse 1, I exhort therefore supplications, prayers, and sessions, etc., be made for all men. All men. Uh, so just kind of keep that in, in mind. And then as it carries on, um, in verse in verse. Six, well, we have the one in verse 4, who will have all men to be saved. And then in verse 6, who gave himself, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Um, so I guess I'll give you my interpretation of it. Uh, it's obviously not mine alone, but it's to me the most uh, plausible interpretation of it. Uh, and and I've got my razor out, and uh, <laughs> this is the one that I think you know for me does it. Um, so the way I would I, I approach it is to sort of say, well, first of all, we're asked to make supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks for all men. So do I should I pray for all men? Um, yes, I think so. You know, we pray for. For believers we pray for non-christians we pray for leaders we pray for um whoever you know we come for a time of prayer nobody says oh, what are you praying for them for you know we, we, we pray for all all men um also um i i think the fact that it says those in authority is not excluding other people because you know if you say all men means all men it includes those who are in authority um, so, again, based on my wider understanding of the New Testament uh, and, and, and biblical principles behind John 3.16, uh, 2 Peter 3.9, 1 John 2 verse 2 is the propitiation for our sins, but not only ours, uh, uh, sorry, is the propitiation for our sins, but not only ours, uh, but, but for whatever it says, all men. <laughs> quote it, quote it properly, yeah. He's a propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, thank you, but also for the sins of the whole world. So so taking those verses and Timothy 4, uh, Timothy 4.10 uh, as well, for therefore we both labour and suffer approach because we trust in the living God who is the saviour of all men, especially those that believe. Uh, so So... so I would say that all in this case um, means means all 
Uh, again, the context in which Paul is speaking to Timothy, he's urging him to keep a, a good conscience, fight a good faith, uh, fight a good fight, or war a good warfare. It says here um, be, to be careful not to make shipwreck of his faith. It's talking about the glorious gospel of the blessed God. Uh, so I think the, the the bit where he's talking about leaders and those who are in authority is like, if you like, an aside. He's sort of saying this this main theme, you know, giving Timothy the ex exhortation as an aside and, and, you know, pray for your leaders and your authorities. And then he's back on the same, the same subject again, which is basically uh, the gospel. Um, so, so I interpret it then when it says all men to mean all men uh, without exception. Could it mean all leaders of men? No. As I said, I think that's more of an aside. But even if it did mean all the leaders of men, that would not contradict uh, my interpretation, would it? Because all men includes kings, leaders, all those in authority. Could it mean all kinds of men? Well, I don't really know what that means. Unless, unless you mean uh, rich men, poor men black, white, Jew, Gentile, if that's what we mean by all kinds of men, again, it's not a contradiction to all men. Uh, so, so all men would undoubtedly include all kinds of men. Uh, so even if the verse meant this, I can't see how that would, you know, limit God's desire for all people to be saved. And, and my final comment really on this verse is a simple one. And it's this. Find me an English Bible translation that renders this verse either all leaders of men or all kinds of men, and I'll listen. Otherwise, razor in hand, I cannot, I cannot in good conscience uh, exegete this in any other way than God desires all men to be saved and the plain meaning of those words being... God desires all men to be saved. Mm. Um, so the argument go against that, or one of the arguments against that is, well, if you're saying all men, doesn't that lead to universalism? Aren't you saying, you know, that God's going to save everybody? No, I'm not saying that. So have a look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew 7 and verse 13. And Jesus says, Enter ye in at the straight or the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. So certainly, no, it doesn't lead uh, to, to everybody being saved. Jesus is quite clear, everybody's not going to be saved. Um, but I start with the biblical principle that I believe the Bible teaches Christ is the saviour of the world. Uh, so just kind of finishing off now, um, I don't really want to go on too long. Um, but going, flicking back to 1 Timothy uh, again. 1 Timothy 2. Um, oh, I'm in 2 Timothy 2. That's why it didn't make sense. Here we go. 1 Timothy 2. So there is there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Obviously, if you know the rest of the scriptures, it's not saying that Christ isn't God. Uh, but in the way that this is said, you know, he's represented as the son of man um, because that's his role as our high priest is, is the one who makes intercession between God and man, the one who is the advocate between God and man. And this is why, you know, you've got to be careful how you interpret the scriptures and, and that, the, you know, we understand who is Christ and, and therefore why is it saying it in this way? Um and, and it finishes in verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. Who ordained him? Who, who said, off you go, Paul, 
go and preach? Was it was it a particular Christ. denomination? Who? Christ. Christ, yeah. On the road to Damascus. He said, right, go and do this. Go, go and preach. Go and take this message. So it shows that ordination does not have to be performed by some <coughs> uh, uh, elected body of or council of church members mm. or anything like that. If God has called you to be a preacher or to be a leader or or whatever it is, then then that is enough. God has ordained you, uh, and, and and Paul emphasises it. I speak the truth in Christ. I lie not. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Verity is one of those old. English words means truth. So um, um, Jesus says, verily, verily. Uh, or, or quo, what is it? Quo est veritas. What is truth? That's what Pilate says. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, verity is truth. Uh, and verily means truthfully. Truthfully, I say unto you. So if you read that, if you've got King James Bible, that's what it's talking about, truth. And um, that's what Paul is. He's a teacher of the Gentiles because... Primarily, he's given responsibility to take the gospel to the Gentiles, as we'll see on Sunday, uh, and to take it in faith and in truth. And uh, that's what we're called to do also.